Good morning, saints, and welcome to December 27th, 2020's Bible study for Sunday School. Today we're going to be focusing on called to prepare. Um, one thing I wanted to start with is something that is called metamorphosis. And metamorphosis is actually explained as in insects and amphibians, the process of transformation from an immature form to an adult form in two or more distinct phases. For example, a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. Metamorphosis in a person is the change of the form or nature of a thing or person into a completely different one by natural or supernatural means. Now, knowing the definitions of metamorphosis, well, obviously we're going to be talking about the person in metamorphosis. And I'd like to talk about um, a change in a young gentleman and it's, called, it's the present day illustration. It's called Call to Prepare. Hey man, you packing up and leaving the hood? Asked Jamal. You too good for everybody now. Man, you know I don't think that, Jasper said, maneuvering around a box and clearing off a seat for Jamal to sit down. Jasper had been renting a rundown apartment because of the price. It was also in a close proximity to his pharmaceutical business. Drugs were rampant in this area and police patrols were few and infrequent. It was a good place to make money. However, for Jasper, those days were in the rear view mirror. After a near death experience, Jasper had heeded the years of pleas and prayers from his family and had given his heart to Christ. His crew had said it was like a deathbed confession and did not expect it to take. This was six months ago, and Jasper was now exploring his new life in Christ. He heeded the voice of his new Christian friends and found a better apartment away from his old drug-filled neighborhood. Drugs are everywhere, man, said Jamal. Yeah, I know, answered Jasper, but I'm God's man now. I know the Lord is going to use me. I know he has a lot in store for me. Like what, asked Jamal. I don't know yet, said Jasper, but just like I made preparations for crime and craziness, I'm going to get myself ready for good to come. Now that was Jamal and Jasper, and Jasper, like I said, had a near-death experience, and he finally heard Christ calling out for him, knocking on his door, and Jasper finally opened the door. And when he opened that door, just wonderful things came in. And like metamorphosis, he changed from one thing into a greater thing by supernatural um, means. Now, I remember a time where I was... Uh, not, I was saved, but I was not living the, the life of a saved person. And my mother lived in Pennsylvania, about six hours away from Rochester. And it seemed like every time I left my mother's house, within uh, probably about an hour of the, of the uh, trip, I would almost fall asleep. I would, got so exhausted. And I would, I would nod off a little bit. One day, I must have nodded off for a long time because all of a sudden, I jerked awake and I saw the facade, the face 
of Jesus Christ on the asphalt in front of my car. That was an awakening. That to me, and, and it did wake me up for sure, um, and I made a safe trip home, but that was the first time I really felt God knocking on my door saying, it is time, it is time for you to come back. And so that's what knocking on the door feels like for me. And it may have felt that way for Jasper. Um, as far as my star story goes, the metamorphosis took a little while because I just didn't, you know, I, I took it seriously, but I went back to my old ways until God knocked on my door again. And I was a smoker and a drinker, but I decided to come back to church. And even though I was coming back to church praising the Lord, um, I had repented um, for many of my uh, sins. I had rejoiced in the Lord, um, but I was still a smoker and drinker. And one day, out of the blue, Christ decided to take that away from me. He just said, boom, you're done smoking. And I went home. I was on a walk with my dogs. I went home, and I destroyed every cigarette, threw out every ashtray, and that was it. I was done smoking. So to have God work in my life and metamorphosize me into a better Christian um, it, was, it was an amazing experience, and God had made it. Some people quit smoking, and they still love the smell of smoke, which me means to me they're really not fully quitting smoking. Well, any time I went up to a person um, or was near a person that was smoking or that smelled like smoke, it was almost a putrid <laughs> type of smell. And... Every time that happened, I just said, thank you, Lord, for taking that horrible act, action from my life. And again, amorphosis, metamorphosis. Today we're going to talk about Matthew 3, 1 through 6. I'll read this scripture. And it's called Preparing the Hearts. In those days, John the Baptist, I'm reading from the NIV version. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of, of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. There's a few points that I want to make out in this passage, um, one of which is very obvious to me, and that is what John the Baptist was wearing. He was wearing clothes made of camel's hair and with a leather belt. Food was locusts and wild honey. This itself shows John the Baptist's humbleness, okay? He wasn't dressed fancy like the kings, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They weren't, he was not looking for people to like him for what he wore. And um, so that's one thing that I saw in this scripture. Another one was prepare the way, uh, this is from, doo -doo 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 -doo, my goodness, Two, verse 2, and it said, prepare the way, no, I'm sorry, verse 3, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, the word straight, to you and me, anyways, is 
a point to another point, just straight across, okay? The shortest distance between one point and another point. That's straight. But when he talked about straight, it was like a, it was like straight meaning being right and good. And I know that, that actually, when we talk about somebody, oh, oh, they're straight, stay away from them, you know, they're straight, and, and um, they, they tended to use it in the right means. Um, so straight goes both ways, but in this passage, it meant going the way of good and being good and right. Um, this was actually a preparation. Again, it said in uh, verse 2, and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What does that remind you of? Heaven has come near. Look at the year 2020, okay? So many people have died. So many people had, had uh, come down with COVID. So many people got deathly ill but made it back. How can you not say at this point in life that the heavens are near, that God is near? Um, we need to repent. We need to be prepared in our hearts for God, because we do not know the day nor the hour that God is going to come. So we need to prepare our hearts for that time. The next uh, verses I wanted to read were from Matthew 3, 7 through 10, and I'm reading from the NIV version. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, as I had spoken before, they were all about material goods. They were all about uh, dressing super nice and not being so humble. And they had heard about John the Baptist, uh, um, baptizing people and having them repent. Well, this is, well, what it says in this scripture is that the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming to repent, but it was kind of like saying, I'm sorry, and not really repenting. Repenting comes from the heart. Repenting comes to truly meaning that you are sorry and you will not do this again and that God is the head. God is the head of this uh, repenting. Uh, the order of what we're reading here is your hearts need to come first. Your hearts need to be with God first. Then you repent. And I uh, wanted to read this snippet. It's when John confronted the Pharisees and Sadducees, he called them a brood of vipers. That John's approach was provocative indicates that sometimes people need a wake-up call to see just how far from God they are. After referring to the religious leaders as vipers, John then asked who had warned them about the wrath that was coming. He challenged them to show the fruit that is the product of true faith and repentance. Today, those whose hearts are hard against the things of God need to understand that though he is patient, his patience has its limits. There will be consequences for the continued rejection of God's Son. 
Again, the Pharisees and Sadducees were uh, praising Abraham and rather than God. John also told the religious leaders that their faith is being is in being children of Abraham was misplaced, that God could turn stones into children of Abraham, demonstrated that physical lineage had absolutely nothing to do with their spiritual standing before God. Likewise, people today need to be aware of the potential for misplaced faith. A person raised in Christian home does not automatically become a child of God. If there were ever a group of people who might have confidence that their good works and religious position could make them right with God, it was these religious leaders. However, no amount of religious works can make us right with God. Only by turning from our sin, repentance, and trusting the Savior for forgiveness from sin, true faith, can we have a right relationship with God and ex escape the wrath to come. So there's a few uh, key points here to actually have, ha have faith and to repent to God. And it's not about good works um, only. It's not about praising Abraham or being of the lineage of Abraham. But um, it's about true faith and repentance. The next scripture we'll be reading, reading would be from prevailing heart upon hearts. No one? I'm sorry. Excuse me. Oh, okay. Okay, go ahead, Precious. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go back to the verse um, where it says, verse 10, where it says, The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Um, to me, that, that made me feel like, um, basically, God is already in like preparation zone to get rid of those who are not trusting in him, who are not believing in him. You know, so, um, I was, uh, me and my mom was watching this show one time where they were talking about like the proper way to cut down a tree. And you have to like start um, from one end and you got to cut up until almost halfway into the tree. And then you go to the other side and then you chop that way that way the tree actually falls in a certain direction okay. don't just cut directly into the tree because then it'll just be like a huge hassle so to me it made me feel like like that was the imagery that i came to my mind when i was reading that and it just makes me feel like so god is saying you know this is obviously the um story leading up to when Je jesus is crucified and um getting ready to you know be criticized and stuff by right. the the people so um he's basically saying like okay we have this savior that's getting ready to come and um you know kind of prepare the way for past sinners and you know sinners that are getting ready to come but god it was like a sign like you need to figure out you know put your your faith in the right thing as you were saying it's not supposed to be in abraham because we they're no longer going to be living in those in those days anymore because they will now have jesus christ so he's kind of sitting there you know waiting like okay so are you going to choose me or are you going to continue to live in you know the disbelief that you have right now and the minute they make that decision it's like all right we gotta go so he's kind of like already beginning that chopping process in the um in the New Living Translation, it says that uh, the axe is at the root, so you're trying to take up the whole entire uh, tree, you know what I mean, and making sure that this tree can't produce anything else anymore. And so that makes me also think of the story when Jesus had, uh, when he cursed the fig tree because it didn't right. produce any fruit. He was making sure that, okay, so since you are supposed to be a tree that produces fruit and you have no fruit on it, then you just won't be a tree. So God is like ripping things up from the root. Like, okay, well, this isn't going to produce anything else since you're not producing anything that is good. So as you were mentioning, um, being on that straight path, yes, you know, obviously in our minds, we think of it as just a direct point, but, um, 
in the in the way that it is mentioned in the scripture it's about having you know righteousness and being on the right side of god and so god is basically like preparing them like john is preparing us to uh, receive Christ, you know, but ultimately Christ was also preparing us to understand that there are consequences to, you know, not really receiving him. And so when he's saying like the ax is, is right there, like we're, we're, we're ready, you know what I mean? I think about like my mom used to like, when we were younger, we would get in trouble and my mom would like stand there with the belt, like, okay, so who did it? <laughs> you knew you was gonna get in trouble, but it was like, now you gotta own up to whether or not, you know, so it was like preparing for the consequences of your actions and so um I just that I don't know that was just like a part that like really stuck out to me that you know God is standing right there and he's waiting you know he's listening he's watching the word says that he searches the hearts of his people you know and so he's like you know just watching like okay what are they going to do what are they going to do who are they going to choose how, how are they going to believe you know and when he sees that your heart is not in the right direction it's like okay gotta go you know and um i think some people tend to misinterpret that as uh god not loving us because he you know is willing to get rid of those who do not love him but i think it's it's uh um, we had a lesson a while ago that was about like pruning and grafting and talking right. about how, you know, God, he uh, brings in those who weren't initially a part of, you know, the covenant and stuff. So I feel like God, uh, in a way, he's showing them like, you know, I loved you your entire life. I provided for you for your entire life. I made ways for you for your entire life. No, it was not always easy. We understand that that is life. Things are not going to always be easy for us, but there were a lot of things that God kept us from and protected us from. And for us to then at the same time not choose him, you know, I can imagine the amount of hurt um, that he feels just having that, knowing that I loved you no matter what. I didn't, you know, it didn't matter what you were doing or the fact that you didn't love me at the time. I still loved you and I still kept you and I was still there for you. And then you still did not choose me, you know. So I feel like it comes with the consequence of not loving him you know it comes with the consequence of not choosing him and so God is saying you know I can only bring people into heaven who love me I don't want you you know around me if you do not love me it's no different than how we are with people you know we right. don't want friends or family members around us when we don't feel like they're genuine or that they don't care or you know are um have uh, our hearts in their best interest you know what I mean so why would God bring people into his space his personal sanctuary you know what I mean holy ground could not even be touched by human if it had been uh, touched uh, on the ground you know I think about when Moses had um came up to the mountain God told him you have to take your shoes off and then you know you can't go come up to a certain point because this is holy ground so if the earth was even like considered holy and untouchable then imagine how um sacred and you know sanctified uh heaven is so why would he want people in heaven who do not love him right. you know why would he want people in heaven who don't choose him or you you wait till you actually get to see the promise to finally be like oh okay yeah this is nice you know what i mean like why would he do that he wouldn't just we wouldn't do that with the people that we have in our lives so why would will god do that so that particular scripture i don't know why it just stuck out to me right. because it just makes me feel like you know um while God is always watching the good that we do, you know, he's paying attention to the good that we do. He's also paying attention to the things that we, we do wrong. And we know that the Sadducees and the Pharisees um, did not believe Jesus. They didn't believe any of the disciples, you know. So I'm sure soon as John had seen them, he immediately knew that they were coming to criticize him baptizing people, you know, and he's like, well, you know, before you even say anything, understand that what I'm doing is in Christ, you know, it is for the coming of Christ. And so you need to choose whether or not you are going to believe in Christ or if you are going to continue to believe, you know, in Abraham. It's good that they they got that far, but it's like now there's, there's more, you know, there's more work to be done. There's more um, Christ to believe in. And so if you're not going to make that decision, then you know, God's going to have to make his decision yeah. to take you out. And we've seen in the Old Testament where he's done that plenty of times before, right. you know. Yeah. Great points. I fully agree. 
Um, one thing that I did want to also add to that, um, actually it comes from the next scripture, uh, which is uh, Matthew 3, 11, 12 in the NIV again. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, his winnowing fork in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into a barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Um, I wanted to bring up the word fire in the scripture. The word fire is both a tool for purification and for judgment. The Apostle Peter captured the essence of fire as a tool for both purification and judgment in his two letters. When God's people go through grievous testing and trial, we can rejoice because our faith is being tried as gold with fire. As fire purges the impurities from gold, so do trials purge the impurities from our faith. That comes from 1 Peter 1, 6-7. This was John the Baptist's emphasis when he had said Jesus would baptize his people with the Holy Spirit and fire. Though God's fiery purification is never pleasant, it is always good, and we can be sure that we will be blessed people for it. However, people, Peter also wrote that there will be a time when a different fire will come, not for purification, but for judgment. The apostle called this day of the Lord, which will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. And that's from 2 Peter 3, 12b. Fiery judgment was also what John emphasized when he spoke of the chaff being fanned into unquenchable fire. Never forget that our God, that our God is a consuming fire from Hebrews 12, 29. So I just wanted to explain what fire meant in this passage, and it's both for purification and judgment. Um, as it spoke, the trials sometimes that we have are just a way of God's purifying us. We need to make it through these trials and tribulations, and if we make it through these, we are become purified, and we become that much stronger in the Lord, and we certainly have blessings to look forward to, because that is got how God raises us up. Um, just uh, speaking on this passage, just before the true king made his public appearance to be baptized, John prevailed upon his listeners one more time to be received by the king, to receive their king. The prophet understood his proper place with the Lord, declaring that he was not even worthy to carry Jesus' shoes. And that goes back to verse 11, where it says, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, that's God, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. We are not worthy to carry Jesus' shoes. John baptized the water of repentance, but he who is more powerful than John would baptize the Holy Spirit and with fire. Both here at the beginning of Jesus' early ministry and at the end of it, we find the promise of the Spirit's work in the lives of believers. When Jesus was about to depart by way of Calvary's cross, he eased his disciples' hearts with the promise that he would send them the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who would abide with them forever. John urged his listeners to understand that every person must choose which fire they will ultimately face. Again, the purification or the judgment. 
Those who put their faith in Jesus will be baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire, a picture of purification from sin in a person's life. However, those who reject Jesus will face the unquenchable fires of judgment, the useless chaff that is left over from the harvest. Like John's listeners some 2,000 years ago, people today also must choose which fire will ulti- they will ultimately face. That, uh, that's your choice. God gave us free will, and he let us know that we can choose the right way or the wrong way. And the right way is becoming purified in the Lord in Jesus Christ. And the wrong way is to not believe in him and walk with him. And that would be judgment. So, um, let's see. Okay. The last part of this is another um, another snippet about uh, just asking um, questions of people. And it says, what is true repentance? It is more than just saying, I am sorry. You can't just come up and say, I'm sorry. Come up to the altar to be blessed and to say, I'm sorry and then walk away and do the same thing, or don't feel sorry, sorrow in your heart. It involves much more than the outward show of walking down an aisle over and over for rededication. True repentance produces good spiritual fruit. The Greek word for repentance, metanoia, breaks down into two parts. Meta, meaning change and noia, meaning mind. The Holy Spirit renews our mind, from Romans 12, 2, through the Word of God. Only the Word of God can transform our minds into the likeness of Christ. See Ephesians 4, 23 to 24. A change of mind leads to a change of heart, or a heart shift, not only in our mind, but also our will and emotions. It is much more than merely the emotion of worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. 2 Corinthians 7.10 Changing our mind and heart involves changing the direction of our spiritual walk. It is as if we're walking in one direction and we turn completely 180 degrees in the opposite direction. We turn away from the sin in which we are participating and we turn completely towards Christ in obedience to his commands and purposes. To run in the opposite direction of Christ is to run in utter rebellion. When we spiritually change our direction, we change our lifestyles as well as our destiny. A right spiritual walk with God produces peace that surpasses understanding, Philippians 4, 7. We can choose to walk with Christ or away from him. True repentance is obedience that leads to a new way of life that is fruitful and pleasing to Jesus Christ. That brings back what I had just said, that God does give us free will, and we can choose to walk with him, or we can choose to walk away from him. And the question is, how fruitful is your life? Are you walking with him, or are you walking away from him? This again brings back the, the words of metamorphosis in the person realm. And it shows that when you walk with Christ, your whole being changes. You change into your heart. Your heart is of Christ, and you repent, 
and people look at you in a different way because you've metamorphosized, metamorphosized <laughs> into a righteous being, into a, a person that means good, okay, from the heart. So that brings about the whole metamorphosis um, cycle in, in the person. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was the supernatural change in your life. Again, the metamorphosis in your life. According to Pastor Vance Havner, repentance is actually a change of mind about sin, self, and the Savior. True repentance involves seeing we are sinners, knowing we can't improve ourselves under our own power and will, and asking Jesus to be the one to save us from our lives of sin. The Holy Spirit then works on us to transform us supernaturally into a new creation, metamorphosize us into a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. That completes our Sunday, uh, Sunday school for December 27th, 2020. And I'd like to uh, end in a prayer for all of us. Um, the new year is coming, and we, of course, hope that it is a better year for all of us. And uh, just remember that God is with us. God will never leave us. Um, as we say, Emmanuel is God with us from St. Matthew 1, 23. He will never leave us. Um, so I wanted to end in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to teach those here in the sanctuary and those online. Um, I thank you for us to fellowship together, and I continue to hope that people, if people have questions, whether online or in the, the sanctuary, they please seek out someone for answers so, and, um, so we can help you become um, closer to Christ. Um, and I just want to thank you also for this beautiful day. No snow today, and it's nice and calm. And I wanted to thank you for everyone here in the, in the sanctuary and online. I hope people got something out of this message. And just remember that to become closer to God, you do need to change your hearts. You do need to repent. And you do need to cleanse yourself. And I just pray that we all can get there. In Jesus' name, amen.